Well, I really haven't been doing this that many times. I, uh, by accident, I started giving, uh, introducing people about three or four uh, luncheons ago, and they said, oh, we think you're great. You need to be the one to do the introductions. But And it started out because uh, uh, several of the other men said that they had housekeeping chores to do. So I said, okay, I'll do it because I really have a housekeeping chore. Now, all of you got a Ron Paul cookbook at the table. And uh, this cookbook, um, actually, Ron calls it his secret weapon. Uh, because in uh, back in uh, 95, when he was, uh, he'd been out of Congress 12 years, been delivering babies, and then they had uh, the contract for America, and he thought, well, maybe they're serious, so he would run again. Well, you know, up there, they knew that he would not go along to get along, so they didn't know if they wanted him, so they were going to try real hard to keep him out, so they put out all kinds of terrible literature about what a terrible person he was, and he was going to give drugs to kids and all kind of stuff. So I said, well, Ron, why don't we do a cookbook and put the pictures of our kids in, and, um, you know, they'll see our kids have turned out pretty well. We probably didn't do anything too terrible. So uh, he said, well, they probably want to hear me talk about the Exchange Stabilization Fund or something like that. But then he said, well, okay, you know, go ahead. So uh, we put out the cookbook, and this is the 11th edition that you have. And the reason I'm really talking about it is because we've never had this problem. We have two small heirs, and if you have cooks at your house and anybody tries them, we just need a small correction. So on page five at the top <laughs> is a, a recipe for banana bread. And it's my recipe, and uh, my kids would come in if they saw rotten bananas on the counter, they'd say, ooh, yay, banana bread. <laughs> well, if you make that banana bread... You will be disappointed unless you add a half cup of oil. For some reason, it got left out. <laughs> and it's been, it was from the first cookbook, so it's a very good recipe, and we've only re repeated a couple, and that's one of them, and repeated it wrong. Either typo or something. Then on page 22, there's a cookie recipe that's called Foothill Dreams or something, but it's from a lady in Washington State, and she wanted me to see if I could, you know, fix it in... I forget how many thousand cookbooks we did, but way too many. I couldn't do it, so I'm doing my very best. But if you make those cookies, you have to have two cups of flour. <laughs> and uh, those are all the corrections. But I think that you'll find in the cookbook everything you ever wanted to know about the Paul family. And I'm excited today. Um, we have uh, 19 grandchildren and five great-grandchildren, and we have one grandchild with us today, uh, Linda. Linda is a senior at Texas A&M. <laughs> um, but her sister is coming later on, who is a UT graduate, and she will get her uh, MD uh, at UT Houston uh, <laughs> soon. So uh, we want you to know that we don't play favorites with school. Her dad graduated from UT and her mother from A&M. It's one of those families, you know, but um, we like them all. And so um, that takes care of that housekeeping. Now I get to introduce... Uh, my sweetheart of 55 years. <laughs> um, most of you know a lot about Ron, and uh, uh, only a few things that you might not know. Uh, he was uh, a state champion track star in high school. In college, he did run, and he uh, wrestled, and he swam, and he believes that exercise keeps everyone's brain fit and body fit, and he still believes it today. He um, walks every morning about three miles, and he rides his bicycle in the afternoon 10 or 12 miles. That is, if we're home and if the campaign trail lets him do that. But he is very serious about it, and he cares so much about our country. When we should be home with our feet up taking our grandkids, we are still out there telling you that America is great, but we're so afraid of what's happening. So I'll let Ron do the rest of the telling of the story. Great to see you, and uh, thank you for your support. <laughs> Campaign's still going on. <laughs> 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 
No, it's, it's wonderful. We expect we had a nice turnout last night where we were in uh, El Paso, and they had uh, they they thought they could get a thousand people out, so they had a room with a thousand, but. We overfilled it. We filled it. We had about twelve hundred there. So uh, tonight we don't have a room. Uh, we're outdoors. So uh, I can't. I guess we can't fill the outdoors. <laughs> but we expect a real good turnout, and that's the way it's been. The other day I was uh, a guest host on Squawk Box, the business station, and they uh, kept saying, "Well, you know, you can't win. You know, it's all over. What are you doing this for?" I said, well, you know, the market has to speak uh, loud and clear, and the market tells me that uh, it isn't over because uh, we had sent out a notice a couple weeks ago uh, that the checking count was a little low, and I think $1.3 million came in, so there's still a lot of support out there. And, uh, and also, when other candidates, when a conventional candidate uh, decides to get out of the race, they're usually they're usually broke, and they, uh, I know I can't raise the money, but they, the people tend not to come out as well. But the money keeps coming in, but our crowds are getting bigger, not smaller. So uh, we were just in California and had three stops, and we had a total of 20,000 people come out. So that tells us there's a fertile field out there, a real market for these ideas, for the ideas of liberty. A lot of people are concerned about what's happening in our country and are convinced that we're on the right track, uh, that we need less government, not more government, and uh, we, we need to change some other, other problems that we have. And of course, I get asked a whole lot, well, uh, can, can you be in so-and-so's administration, or if you, have, if you win, are you going to put them in the administration, and, and will you endorse so-and-so? I said, well, you know, it's, it's really difficult for me because the other candidates, and they'll try to direct you to maybe attack another candidate. And I said, well, I, I sort of see it as a group. Uh, I lump them together. Because the other candidates uh, tend to believe about the same things, a variation. I mean, and you can put the Democrats in the same category. If you take foreign policy, uh, how many non-interventions are there? You know, it's been a few years since we've had one. Uh, we certainly had them in the beginning of our history. The founding fathers certainly advised us stay out of entangling alliances. So I put, put all the candidates, including the president, in the same category. That we have this uh, obsession and necessity to be, go be going around the world. And uh, what other candidates really think that we should uh, rein in the Federal Reserve System like we do? And I think that's very important. So we have we have that, and as well as in entitlements. Uh, you know, the, the others might talk about it, but they endorse the system. Especially on our side, too many support the entitlement system for the very wealthy. Oh yeah, they're too big to fail, so we have to bail out the Goldman Sachs and the banks and the car companies and everybody else. So that 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 is the reason I think uh, the philosophy of liberty has such great appeal is that it doesn't play special interest. I think something else is going on and has happened in these last four years, and that is the recognition of how serious our problems are. You know, we, we talked about these four years ago. We got a lot of people energized and a lot of people joined in this effort, but uh, once the housing bubble burst and the uh, economic crisis hit, and I sense that uh, most people in this country realize it's, it's not over, uh, they're, they're talking about the problems in Europe, and we are going to bail out Europe with our dollar. Uh, as people see through this. Also, in the foreign policy, we're at a point now where um, most people realize that uh, we've been over there too long. Uh, and I know we get more receptions with the younger generation on college campuses, but I think this whole message has changed because it's like 70% of the American people now say, come home from Afghanistan, and I believe that's what we ought to do. So we cannot sustain this. We cannot sustain the spending and the deficits, uh, the intervention, the undermining our civil liberties, and uh, this uh, foreign presence. Most, uh, most big uh, countries uh, and empires never get, I guess I guess they never, but essentially never get beaten by another military power. Who would touch America today? We do have the most military, strongest military power in the history of the world. Uh, 
and nobody's going to attack us. We should feel comfortable rather than so insecure. The way we go around the world, we act like we're scared to death. There was one night uh, on TV when Santorum was hitting me hard on that, and I was going to say something like, the problem, uh, the problem with you, Rick, is that you see a terrorist under your bed at night. <laughs> Statistics are, are, are fairly reassuring that uh, I think you have about a hundred or more times be better chance of uh, likelihood of being killed by lightning than by a terrorist. But you know, if you point out these, these statistics and say, you know, back off a little bit, don't worry so much, and I say, oh, you don't care about terrorism. <laughs> but if you really care about terrorism, you have to understand why terrorists want to attack us. And uh, the DOD, the Department of Defense, the CIA, uh, the, C the uh, FB, uh, well, the 9-11 uh, Commission, as well as the Confession of Bin Laden, they come because we're in their face, in their country, we occupy their countries, and we have a military presence on land that they consider holy land. And then they say, well, it has nothing to do with it. Even Paul Wolfowitz, after 9-11, he, he wrote, he probably was half asleep because he was telling the truth. <laughs> he said, now we can take that base out of Saudi Arabia because that was one of their big gripes and that was one of the reasons why they came over here and attacked us. Of course it was one of the reasons they disapprove of what we're doing. So there, there's uh, you know, concrete evidence about uh, why, uh, why there's others that would like to come here and attack us. The person that um, provides the most information on, uh, on bin Laden and al-Qaeda is Michael Schur. Um, and he, he ran the uh, CIA unit on the, uh, for bin Laden for years, might have been 10 or 15 years, so he really knows it. But he's not the CIA now and has written uh, uh, many books. And also Robert Pape, uh, who wrote a book called... Uh, uh, dying to win, and it was suicide terrorism, and why people commit suicide terrorism. And these these are real students of uh, uh, of the problem that we face uh, today. Um, e even today, this whole idea of terrorism under international law as well as our law. If if you if an individual goes and has a bomb and blows up a building. It's an act of terrorism, but it's committed a crime. It's not a considered an act of war. So we have morphed from that definition into saying anybody that has done it is, has committed an act of war and therefore uh, can't be tried in a civilian court. Uh, but, but today it is assumed that uh, anybody not who has committed an act of terrorism, but anybody who has been associated with an organization that might be introducing uh, you know, the notion of doing harm can be considered, uh, you know, uh, somebody who has committed an act of war against us, and that is the reason they've changed the rules or the laws. The president, uh, matter of fact, the Congress did it and gave it to the president, and that is under the National Defense Authorization Act, saying that the military now has the authority to arrest us because we could become a suspect because of maybe the web pages that we're looking at or what kind of email we have. So not only do we have this major economic crisis and foreign policy out of control. We have, we have this systematic attack on our on our civil liberty, and one one thing how this ha how this works politically is that uh, it is politically it's a negative to have the positions that we hold to run and deal with only Republican primary voters because they tend to not have as much concern about personal protection of civil liberties, and they tend to want to, I mean, just think of all the other Republican candidates. They couldn't, they were trying to outdo each other on how aggressive they had to be in sending more troops over and attacking the next country, you know. So, but if you take those views and you apply them to the American people, all of a sudden, as I talk about so often, how freedom brings us together for for various reasons. Well, freedom and this foreign policy can bring people together too because there are, there's a growing number of people in the Republican Party who uh, knew that at one time this was a legitimate position. Matter of fact, uh, George Bush, Junior George Bush, George, George W. Bush, uh, 
knew and understood this because what was his foreign policy position in the year 2000? You know, a humble foreign policy, uh, no nation building, no policemen of the world, and he wins the election, condemned the Democrats uh, for the same thing. But now, there, so there are Republicans that agree. The independents, certainly a large number, a non, uh, the younger generation and the new generation is just coming into voting and really haven't made a decision exactly where they fit in the political spectrum, as, as well as many Democrats will come together on this. So it is a big coalition of individuals. And a good test of this has been when they tested my name against Obama compared to Romney. Sometimes I beat him, sometimes I'm tied with him. So it's a very, very popular position uh, considering the fact that we are taking on the establishment of both parties, the establishment of the uh, uh, of the media as well as practically all the politicians and, and most of the professors of the country. But it's a powerful idea. The need is so great right now uh, for reorienting ourselves toward a dis different system of government. I am actually very encouraged <clears throat> by what's happening uh, with the number of people that are joining, the ability to spread our message uh, uh, around uh, the world, and literally around the world with the internet, concerned about how they want to attack the internet, this cybersecurity bill is going to be voted on tomorrow, and I'm hoping that the schedule will permit. I'm working very hard to try to get to Washington to vote, you know, against that bill because it is a serious, serious problem. And uh, uh, the the, uh, the support though is is growing, but uh, on the surface in Washington, it's uh, you, you don't get encouraged by being in Washington. You get encouraged when you come out and meet people like you. And hopefully we continue our encouragement when we come out and see the rally tonight and have a, a lot of young, energetic people saying, uh, yeah, we know what's coming. It's not a bad deal. A lot, a lot of times they ask me, they say, well, Romney's saying this about students, what he's going to give to students when they talk about giving the students stuff. And then Obama's going to outdo that. He's going to give them more stuff. And I said, well, what I want to do is give the young people their freedom to make their own choices and also the, uh, the right to opt out of the system if they want and the right to keep their own money and give them a job. <laughs> But, you know, one problem leads to another. Uh, one good deed, so-called good deed, leads to another. So the effort was the federal government should take over education because we're going to improve education and equalize it, socialize education, and we have seen what it has done to the public uh, school system. Then we say, well, we need to get more money into the college system. So the taxpayers are required to pump more money into the uh, uh, secondary education. And guess what? More people go. But do they get a better education? No. More students might go. More money goes in. Guess what the number one result of that is prices go up. The cost of education, just like in medicine. The more money you pump into medicine, the higher the cost. Education they did. They, oh, well, now, now we've pushed these prices up, and, and uh, they always know that the inflated price has nothing to do with the monetary system, nothing to do with the government. So they say, well, there's a problem out there, so what we need to do is give more money to students. And, or they don't have the money. Well, we can't do that. We'll just loan the money to the students. And then the students are called, pulled into this, they borrow the money, and then finally they get out of college, and now it's, it's the biggest lump deficits bigger than credit card debt over a trillion dollars and then they don't have the job so uh, now they're coming along and they're saying now what are we going to do uh, to prop the system up well the best thing is to prop the system up is to uh, undermine uh, this whole concept and, and restore respect for individual liberty self-reliance uh, self-determination the constitution the whole work this would this would solve our problems the educational system was no better served by what federal government's doing than saying, well, let's make sure every poor person has a house. That's a good motivation. But if you want the maximum number of poor people to have a house, as you have to argue for sound money, limited government, free markets, a sensible foreign policy, and get the government out of our lives. Yes, it won't be perfect, but it'll be a lot better than the mess we're facing now. So we just need a lot more confidence in ourselves that the free market can work much better.
but the revolution is alive and well. We started talking about a revolution, a nonviolent philosophic revolution, four or five years ago, and that's where we're really making progress uh, because these are. Uh, unfortunately considered revolutionary ideas, but really it's an extension of the original revolution. <laughs> but it's revolutionary to stop and, and make people think, well, maybe we were on the right track. Maybe we were, we were diverted from this. We didn't have a perfect system, so we don't have to argue, well, we want to go back to the status quo of the, of the 19th century or some other place. But you can go and pick up the good pieces and uh, pick up the, you know, once again, respect the Bill of Rights. Once again, believe in the Fourth Amendment. Get rid of the Patriot Act and a few other things like that. <laughs> So the respect for the Constitution should be uh, welcome. Uh, we shouldn't go to war without a declaration. Why not look at the Constitution? <laughs> look, look at the Constitution, uh, you know, on the monetary issue. So that's all, all available to us. And uh, this, this is what the revolution is doing, picking up the pieces. But I think the major task, and I've talked about this so often, is trying to put this concept of liberty in a, in a single package, that uh, your economic liberty is the same thing as your personal social liberty. You can't have social personal liberty without having economic liberty, but there are some who will defend one but not the other or vice versa. But it's all one thing. If you have a right to your life, you have a right to your liberty, you ought to have the right to the fruits of your labor and run your own life as you choose and accept the consequences of the decisions that you make and that's what a free society is all about. <laughs> And then you can take that, you can apply that across the board, economics, uh, you know, social problems, as well as foreign policy. If you don't want the government to tell you what to do with your personal life, why should our government tell other governments or other people around the world what they're supposed to do? But actually, the neoconservatives believe this philosophically, and they're really into this philosophically. They say, well, we have this moral authority and responsibility to spread our goodness around the world. I mean, they, they're uh, Jacobins, neo-Jacobins who believe that if people, if you have a good story to tell, you need to force it on people. Of course, in the French Revolution, you know what happened if you didn't go along with what they told you. So uh, they, they believe this obligation of spreading our uh, exceptional values, which we have had in the past, uh, we should force it on others. I believe we have been an exceptional nation. I still believe we can resurrect all our exceptional values, that we should work hard to set a good standard on monetary policy, economic policy, personal liberties, a sensible foreign policy, and still defend our country. And uh, then, if we do a good job, maybe the rest of the world would want to say, hey, you know, America looks great. Why don't we try what they do? Why don't we emulate what America, that is a much better way than using force and intimidation around the world. <laughs> if there's every reason to be, uh, to, to be optimistic about the progress we're making, uh, we don't know what tomorrow will bring next month or November. But I do know that uh, we're going in, in the right direction. I believe the financial system is very fragile. Things could change rather rapidly. The international situation is a mess because somebody might uh, have a false flag and an American vessel gets blown up in the Persian Gulf, and that will be the excuse you know, to start World War III, something like that. There's always these kind of potentials that could happen uh, rather quickly. But the foundations, the foundation of our civil liberties, the foundation of our constitutional law, the foundation of our monetary system have, have really been severely undermined. So this is the reason that our obligations are rather heavy on us, uh, because most people never get involved in these things. Uh, the large majority of people in any society, so they sort of go along, they vote superficially all, but it's always a small number of people who become energized and, and have to spread a message. So uh, you're in that group, you have that burden, and, uh, and you have to participate one way or other. You're participating by being here, and I, I thank you for that. But uh, this is the only way 
society can change is changing people's ideas. People, people's hearts and minds have to be changed and they have to be energized and feel good about what they're doing. That's where we're successful. And once again, I want to thank you very much for your participation. Thank you.